Hallelujah. There's no rock like our rock. More and more, the Lord's Word is just exciting. And I don't know, it's just hope. I find God's Word to be a great anchor of my soul. I, I, I find out that my soul these days is overwhelmed more than not. But when my heart is overwhelmed within me, Lord, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. And that's what the psalmist prayed for. That's what he asked the Lord to do, and he will do it. God's Word has just been, I don't know, so refreshing and so wonderful and meaningful. And in more ways than ever I've seen before, God's Word is just meaningful to me. And I'm grateful. I'm grateful for the prayers that He's answered. He's answered prayers here today, and I'm thankful for that. I'm glad you're here this afternoon. Uh, and I want to take a little bit of time and go to the Scripture. And I believe God is here with us. He can, He's here this morning. He'll meet us this afternoon. How many believe that? We're gathered in His name still, are we not? Amen. We've gathered in the name of the Lord. We're, we're not here to just do personal business. And this is not to us a mere religious duty and activity. We really want to learn something. I thank God for folks who want to learn something and, and want to grow in God's Word and, and for a hunger for growth. And may we take the Scriptures and, and, and apply them to our lives. To read that book and say, how, how does that apply to me? How can I put that into practice? How can that become something? How can that be real in my life? And it's not through your mere efforts to apply it, but your reliance upon the Spirit of the Lord. He will do it. He will help you with it. He will write it in your heart and in your mind if you will, will desire that and hide it there for Him to work. So I want to go um, this afternoon, if I can. I really don't have a uh, a text. I, I want to I want to deal with a topic more so. I'll, I'm going to be going to Romans in a moment, and then from there I've got several other places I want to go. But uh, thank the Lord for His Word today to our hearts. The message this morning for. Let us become a church that our faith is spoken of about. Let us become a church where our faith is growing exceedingly and our love is fervent towards one another and we are persevering in all of our trials and whatever we're facing, that we're coming through it. (laughs) That we're conquering. Amen. That we're... we're, Our trials are not uh, destroying us. Because we're not wood, hay, and stubble. But we're gold, we're silver, and we're precious stones. And the fire is only making us more pure. Amen? That's what we want. And we appreciate the emphasis upon that placed this morning. This Wednesday evening was actually, I don't know, for whatever uh, uh, reason, too much on my mind or something, but Brother Doug was actually scheduled to preach Wednesday night. And um, I, I just forgot all about it. And, and um, I preached... But uh, I went to uh, 1 Timothy chapter 1 and talked about that the end of the commandment is love out of a pure heart, a good conscience, and faith unfeigned. And uh, I, I just, I don't know, I couldn't get that out of my mind. and I, I, don't, I didn't try too hard to get out of my mind either. Uh, when, when the Lord's burning a scripture in my mind, I don't, I don't try hard to get it out of my mind. I, I usually... You know, if I say I couldn't get it out of my mind, I really didn't want it out of my mind, or, or I suppose I could have done so, but uh, it just kept coming to me and coming to me. And I got to thinking about it as I, I went home, and, and uh, as an offshoot of that message, I'll go back to Timothy and Sound Doctrine here, uh, maybe Wednesday night. But what was on my uh, heart when I, I left here Wednesday night, I was thinking about this business of our thoughts and, and this idea of our mind being a battleground. And I remember when Brother Messer was here, it was something that the Lord had been speaking to my heart. And I remember when he came and did the conference about uh, the battlegrounds, putting on the armor of God, and how he talked about the battle in the mind. I thought, wow, this is exactly what God's been dealing with my heart about. And I've watched it. I've watched it in my own life. I've watched it in the lives of others that we lose it here oftentimes. Uh, If you don't conquer the battle in your mind, You'll lose it everywhere else. Uh, One writer said, whatever plays in the theater of our mind will form the habits of our heart. And the heart will either 
uh, if, if the mind has right things, it should strengthen the heart. The heart becomes the final answer, becomes the final uh, work that the enemy tries to get. What the enemy is after is your heart. That's where God inhabits. That's where God dwells at the center of our life. Christ dwells in our hearts by faith, the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 3. And so, uh, if the heart is strong and the mind is strong, then the battle that, the battle that comes to the mind can be won uh, and, and will be won. But if the heart is weak and the mind is weak, then quite frankly, the battle will be lost in the mind. It will make its way to the heart and the heart will be destroyed and lose out with God. And we don't want that. We want to love God with all of our heart. Amen. We want Christ uh, in our hearts and, and, and dwelling at the center of our life, being our passion, our, 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 the one that we're, we're looking towards and we want to be like. He is the one that you and I seek to imitate and seek to uh, uh, be, uh, be like Him. So I, I want to go back a little bit and I, I want to try really to, I'm not going to, I know, mention anything new here, but I really want to talk a little bit about because as I was preaching that message Wednesday night, I saw a lot of folks, you know, really, yeah, yeah, that's me. I, yeah, that's me. I'm struggling there. And, and I, not just one, but several people. How many of you folks have had a battle in your mind? If, you, if you're not alive, if, you're, if you didn't raise your hand, okay, you're just either asleep or you're dead, one or the other. But there's a tremendous battle that takes place in our thinking. Tremendous, tremendous battle that goes on in our mind. And, and I'll talk about some of the ways that, that the enemy comes to us. But I, I, I want to try to share with you some few simple things from the Word of God this afternoon. How do you win that battle? How do you win that battle? Because it's a battle you've got to win. If you lose the battle in your mind, if you lose it there, the enemy has found a way to get to your heart. And he will destroy you. And you and I have got to win that battle. Here in the bombardment today against our mind, I think is, I say maybe it's greater than ever before. You know, the more you become, the more you grow, the more you learn of Christ, and, and the more you put in your mind, then the more the enemy comes to attack and to uh, turn you away from God. So I, I want to talk about winning the battle in the mind because it's a tremendous battleground. And you and I have got to be able to put that hope of that helmet, that hope of salvation that is there. We've got to be able to put it on and, and we've got to be able to win this battle. Now that battle comes to us by way of various ways. We're, we're out there, we see things in this world and we are tempted. And the enemy comes. Right there is the first thing. The thought comes. The uh, And we have to deal with it. There's a picture that comes to your mind. There's an image that comes to your mind. And that image is either good or it's bad. It's either positive or negative. It's either destructive or constructive. And and you you have to deal with that. You either got to... Uh, you can, it's something that can be used to build up or you've got to put it out and away from your mind and defeat it. There's, there are a lot of areas that we have that. Men battle today in their minds because of the, uh, uh, the promiscuity that is around us, the lewdness, the sensuality of the culture in which we live. Women as well. Uh, that's a terrible battle in our world that quite frankly in our culture years ago was not as tough as it is today. The wicked, more wicked your culture is, the more temptations it can come to you. Is that fact. There are more pressures placed on marriages today than there ever have been. Amen? I tell you something. 75, 80 years, go back before no-fault divorce laws. Go back to the time when our culture, when you could, I mean, the only time you would see a lewdly dressed woman is if you went down to red light district somewhere. You went to a section of town that you might not normally go to. But you went to Walmart, you didn't see nakedness. You didn't, you didn't see uh, women dressed in scantily clad uh, clothing. You, you didn't see that. Uh, you didn't see the billboards. You didn't see the lewdness. You didn't see the suggestions. You, di you didn't see the suggestive pictures, photos, ads in Walmart and right. I don't care where you go. Uh, they use sex to sell everything. It doesn't matter from a, from a cough drop to a car. It's used to sell it. And uh, it doesn't matter which way you go. It's there. It's in our culture. So I'm not telling you that men haven't been tempted by that. But I'm telling you that that is an added pressure in our culture today. How many agree with that? 
It's an added pressure. And it wasn't as great a pressure. Mary, people had struggled in their marriages years and years ago. But I can tell you, when you had a culture where there was such a stigma attached to a divorce, folks' divorce didn't enter their mind. It just, it just wasn't something you thought about. It wasn't an option for you uh, because people just didn't do that kind of thing. Or, and there was a lot of social stigma against it. But all the social stigma is gone now. All the social stigma relative to nudity and, 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 and sensuality is gone. There is no social stigma attached to those things today. And so therefore, what we have seen is that as the stigmas, as the external limitations have been removed, we've seen a nation that's plundered and, and that it just went headlong into sin and revealed the wickedness that's been in the hearts of, of men and women. And my, my point in saying that is, is when you've got a culture where certain sins are prominent, you've got to be more aggressive in your life in those areas. You've got to be more cautious, more careful, guarding and watchful in your life in those areas because these things are more prominent in your culture. And we're getting to the place where all kinds of sin are prominent. And, and, and so we have to be on our guard more and more and more and more and more because of the way that temptation can come to us. And if you think that in some way in this culture today that you can relax, you can take it easy, and you can sit back and not be on your guard, you are going to be a meatloaf for the devil. Because he is going to take care of you, my friend. And, and he's going to take you out. We have got to do what the Bible says, and that is to be sober and watch. We have got to be steadfast and resist the enemy. And we have got to be watchful because our enemy is going about to destroy us. So... The, that's the first area. There's areas in such uh, divisiveness. There, there, uh, the idea of the enemy trying to divide us, to, to separate our unity. We live in such a critical culture. I mean, it is absolutely today, I don't care what talk show you go on, wherever you go, everybody is criticizing somebody else and everybody's blaming someone else for what's wrong in the world today. Nobody wants to take personal responsibility. So it's very easy in a culture where everybody plays the blame game for us to play the blame game. Because it's acceptable. Everybody does it. It's very easy for us to back off in, in various areas in our life because that's what's going on around us in our world as we speak. We cannot be molded by the culture. We must be molded by, or molded by the Scripture. I understand that. I'm just telling you that our temptations are going to come down the channels uh, that are open and that are, uh, are being used in this world to destroy our culture. And that's where you and I have got to be on our guard. So there, this, in our minds, there becomes a tremendous battle for our faith our theology is under attack in every area you can name it every doctrine that we have near about is under attack there are so many churches there are so many faiths and doctrines and belief systems and uh, the idea of the ecumenical movement bringing everything together I'm going to tell you if you'd have been in this nation uh, the uh, uh, back in, in the times of our forefathers that you would not even have hinted at you at somehow thinking that Allah is the same as Jehovah they would have kicked you out so fast and thought you, you don't even know what in the world you're talking about. You've lost your marbles. And I'm talking about the leaders of the nation would have done that to you. Uh, if you would have talked about in any way merging Catholicism and Protestantism, I'm telling you right now, they would have thought you lost your marbles. You're crazy. Because they were close to it. They were a lot nearer to the Reformation than you and I are. And they remembered. They remembered the struggles. They remembered the difficulties. They know the persecution that came to them. And they know what it was to protest against the church and come out of it and lose their lives in the process. So they knew what that was all about. And if you want to talk about hand-holding with those who still believe in quote-unquote the mother church and go back there to where they were in that pagan, idolatrous Catholic religion, they would tell you... You are gone. You've lost it. So, but today, everything goes, anything goes. Put it all in the same basket and make duck soup. It doesn't matter. We'll all eat it. So that's where we are. And you and I are in the midst of that to shine as a, a, a lighthouse. And the bombardment that can come right here is tremendous. The anxieties, the fears, the difficulties, the stresses, the strains, they all come right here. So I'm going to I'm going to try to go through this uh, 
and just share a few things with you here this afternoon. The first part I can cover fairly quickly, but I, I, it is important and I want to cover it. I want you to go to Romans chapter 5. Let me make a statement. I'm only going to talk about three things, but two of those things do have three points under them. The last one doesn't. But the, those three things. Number one, I want to talk about this. If you're going to win the battle in your mind, you've got to, you need to pursue the foundational experiences of Christianity. We call them this. Save, sanctify, and filled with the Holy Ghost. Do not see that those experiences are experiences to put you at a, a level or so that once you have those experiences, you are automatically strong, powerful, and mature. No, those are foundational experiences. They are not the epitome of the Christian life. They are the very beginning of the Christian life. I can tell you, first of all, justification. If you're not saved, you're not going to win the battle in the mind. You're already lost it anyway. You're walking in vanity and you're walking in darkness, so your mind is going. The first thing that happens to us when we get saved is God illuminates us. We come out of the darkness into the light and there's an illumination in our minds. We now see the light of the knowledge of the glory of God has shined in our minds. Where we have been blinded, we now have been illuminated by the Lord Jesus Christ. And something happens in your mind when you get saved. The pardon comes to you. Takes away the guilt that was there to drag you down. Cleans up the conscience and restores it so that it works again. Where the conscience was seared, now it begins to operate again. And good is now good and evil is now evil. And it, only according to what you know. But at least in the things that you know. And and, and some to some people who have been maybe have been raised in a Christian home and knew more, they're going to have an even greater awakening in their mind, but others that don't know anything about it, they've never heard of Jesus, they don't know anything about the Bible, then at least in the things of the basics of the Ten Commandments, those things are going to be illuminated to them, and the, and the conscience is going to be restored, and now there's going to be within them a sense of right and a sense of wrong. That is in the mind. That is some transformation has taken place by, because they have changed their mind towards God. God has saved them and justified them, just getting the guilt out of your mind gives you a wonderful liberty to go forward in Jesus Christ. And the devil's going to try to bring the guilt back on you. One of your first battles as a Christian is going to be to make you think you're not saved. So you get saved and you know you've been, you know your experience was real. You know you got, you got forgiven. You know that your sins are under the blood. You felt different. You, you feel different. Your perspective is different. Your life is turned around. But just go a week or two and the old liar will come back and jump on your shoulder. When you have a day, you get up and you don't feel quite as jumpy. You don't feel quite as jubilant, you know, and, and ready to go. And that old liar and slanderer jumps on your shoulder and he starts hounding you. It ain't really nothing. It was just a temporary thing. You just made it all. Up. It's not really real, and, and, and you don't really have this wonderful salvation, you know. It's just a bunch of junk. Look at those folks. You're going to find hypocrites among them anyway, and uh, you know what? You just well go back where you were before. And right there in that mind begins a tremendous battle, and you have got to conquer it by knowing I put my faith in God, I have been saved, and praise God, I intend to stay saved by His grace. But you gotta go beyond that. Now I don't, I'm not gonna take time and dwell on a lot of these, but they're found in Romans. You can go to Romans chapter 5, therefore being justified by faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. There's peace that comes. First thing that happens to justification is you're not at war with God anymore. But you're not at war with God. That's the idea. You got peace with God. But you are now at war with the devil. You did have peace with the devil and war with God. Now you've got peace with God and war with the devil. So, God, you did fight against God. Now you're no longer fighting against God. You're now going to fight against the devil. And fight you will. Fight you will if you want to live. you got peace. We have access in verse 2. He talks about into the grace uh, or by faith into the grace where we stand. We rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And I, I'm not going to go all through that. But I, I want you to understand that the, the effect that takes place in the mind, if you are going to win, you've got to first of all have this business of justified. You've got to know your sins are under the blood. You've got to get the freedom from the guilt and the shame of sin out of your life or you're never going to win the battle in the mind. If there's anywhere that there can 
can come to you a sense of guilt. If there's anywhere that there's a known sin, if there's anywhere in your life where you know there is enmity between you and God, you and everything between you and God is not right, you can't win the battle in the mind. You've got to be justified. You can listen. You may not be justified in the court of Satan. Don't worry about the court of Satan. He's going to condemn you. He's going to criticize you all day long. But when you stand in God's court, there's where you've got to be justified. You have got to have that justification or forget it. I've got to know that somebody approves of me and it's got to be God Almighty. Second thing is sanctification. Romans chapter 6 and 7. I don't have time to go into the theology of that, but... Uh, 6 and 7 deal with the terms of this idea of, of enslavement and bondage. You'll hear those terms used again and again, being bound and being in enslavement. So that in, in chapter 6 and 7, he's not talking about freedom from the guilt and shame of sin, but he's talking about freedom from the enslavement of sin. Because sin does more than bring guilt. Sin does more than bring condemnation. Sin brings bondage. It will bring more than a seared conscience. It will bring more than a violated conscience. If you practice a particular sin, you will become a slave to that sin. Sin not only affects your mind, it affects your body. Just the way it is. And your body will become a body of sin. So that the body is now characterized by sin. It's lost it's natural appetites, and those appetites have become perverted, and so that now you are living in a body that is addicted, is the term we use. Addicted, the Bible uses the term enslaved, but that's the same idea. An addiction is an enslavement. Something you can't quit, isn't it? It's something that you're bound to. It's something that you'd like to get rid of, but it just keeps nailing you to the wall. It keeps drawing you into its net again and again and again. Now, I'm going to tell you, when you read Romans chapter 6 and you read Romans chapter 7, you, particularly down in chapter 7, we get the language. Look down to verse 23. In verse 22, he said, I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind. Warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. Here's the law of sin in his members. What is the law of sin? Whosoever commits sin becomes the servant of sin. That's the law of sin. And that law is in the members, in the body. So that the body is addicted and enslaved by sin. The mind has been freed from the guilt. The mind has been liberated. The mind now desires to do the right thing. The heart wants to do what is right. But the body is still bound by appetites. It's bound by addiction and enslavement enslavement. And he said, I have got this problem. I have got a problem that the addictions or the enslavement, the law of sin that is dominated in my body is warring against the law of my mind. If you get Christ and you get free from the guilt, you get free from the shame. But because of the sins you've committed, your body's become accustomed to having the illicit sex. Your body has become accustomed to enjoying what comes from lying, cheating, gambling. Your body has become accustomed to the drugs, to the pornography. Your body has become accustomed to the alcohol, to the tobacco. And so that your body is craving these things and the heart and mind say no. And I'm here to tell you, in that kind of condition, you will have an internal war going on. And you are going to have a hard time winning the battle, remaining in that condition. You've got to not only get the mind free, you've got to get the body free so that that body can be delivered to do the thing that God wants you to do. You are not going to win the battle in your mind if there are addictions in your body. If your body is enslaved to sin, you are going to lose the battle if the enslavement is not broken. It's just that way. You let the, the enemy, a man gets saved, he's been addicted to pornography, and a man gets saved. And he knows he's right. He knows he wants to do right. And he knows it's wrong. And he even goes home and throws all his magazines away. But he's only been justified. And he's not experienced that liberty of Romans 6 and 7. The law of sin is still active in his body. The mind wants to do what's right. But the law of sin is active in his body. And I'm telling you something right now. And the devil goes and jumps on him and brings a picture back. Because when you get saved, God doesn't erase your mind. Amen? 
Any of you folks got your memories erased when you got saved? That might work on Star Trek, but it doesn't work in Christianity. You know? It just doesn't work. You, you, you don't get your mind erased. And, and, and so he jumps on your shoulder a week later and he starts, you feel, you've been feeling really good for a week or so. You've been doing good. And he jumps on and he brings back a mind. But now what happens is he arouses and he appeals to an addiction that is there in that body to a past sin. But the problem is, is you've not gotten the liberty that you need to get. And you can sit there and you can try to conflict with that thing. And most of the Christian world today, what they do is they say, you need to go to a support group. You need to get this. You need to get that. No, what you need to do is go to Jesus. Christ and find the deliverance that is in Him and let the power of the law of sin be broken in your body by the power of the law of the Spirit of life which is in Christ Jesus. And God can take and break those addictive uh, uh, power, that addiction, that enslavement that is in your body and so that your appetites can be restored to normal and it will be as you were before you became addicted to that sin. You weren't born addicted to pornography. You weren't born addicted to cigarettes. You weren't born addicted to alcohol. You weren't born addicted to chewing tobacco. No, you picked it up and you did it several times and then you developed the habit and and your body became enslaved to it. So, a man in this kind of state When you've got a law of sin in your body that's warring against the law of your mind, I'm telling you, you've got an internal struggle going on and it's going to be hard for you to win that battle. What you need to do is get that law of sin destroyed in your body so it won't war against the law that's in your mind. Amen? And you can experience that wonderful sanctifying power of God free from every addiction and move on. I don't care whether it's laziness. I don't care what it is. Whatever it is, whether it's overeating you, whatever you become addicted to in that body, let it be broken so you can get back to normal. And so you don't have that internal struggle. And then Romans chapter 8 talks about again this power of the Spirit in our life and that we walk after the Spirit not after the flesh and we fulfill the righteousness of the law. The righteousness of the law is fulfilled in us who walk not after the Spirit but after the flesh. I'm sorry, not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Sorry, The righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. That Holy Ghost baptism. You need to be filled with the Holy Ghost, not as the essence of Christianity, but as the stepping stone, the initial outlook of life. Because what you need in order to win the battle against the enemy is you need a mind that's free from guilt. You need a mind that doesn't have to battle bodily addictions. And you need a mind that's governed and controlled by the power of the Holy Spirit. Everything has been brought under the power of the Holy Spirit. And those are in basic foundational Christian experiences. Salvation, sanctification, and Holy Ghost baptism. I know we've taken those experiences many times, and particularly us as Pentecostals, and we've thought, only thing, well, being filled with the Spirit, that's great just so I can shout and I can praise God and I can speak in tongues and I can have gifts. Uh, I can tell you it's, it, there, that may be things that come with it and, and part of it, but the idea is you can have power. You can have power. God wants to baptize you in the Spirit so the Spirit become, can become your ambience, so the Spirit becomes your atmosphere. Like a fish is in water, He has placed you in the Spirit. You're in Christ and the, He's baptized you in the Spirit. He wants to inundate your life with the Holy Ghost so that you can walk in the Holy Ghost, so that you can walk under the continual Continuous dominion and influence of the Spirit of the living God. And if you want to win the battle of the mind, you've got to get that mind of the, under the continual influence of the Holy Ghost. And that comes by getting your life filled with the Spirit of the Lord God. I need that voice talking to me. I need more than the voice of conscience. I need more than the voice of, of my brothers and the preacher. I need the inward power and presence of the Holy Ghost that talks to me and prompts me to to do the things that are right. I'm not going to be able to conquer the battle in the mind without the power of the Holy Ghost. I need that power. That's foundational. Write it down. Say, God, save me. Justify me. Sanctify me. Fill me with the Holy Ghost. So my life, then your, uh, your influence. That's the first thing you got to do to win the battle. Second thing, Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. For me, a verse of Scripture. In verse 2. Interesting thing is, as God gets you saved and He gets you out of the world, guess what? He doesn't want you going back to it. Now that He's got you saved, now that you've been delivered from it, now that the power of it's been broken in your life and you've overcome it, He wants you to understand 
Not only are you separate from the world, not only do you, uh, uh, have you been called out from that world, but you are not to conform your life to it. The world is not your standard any longer. It used to be you lived by the world's standard. What everybody else did, that's what you did. Whatever was popular, you know, basically, whichever way the culture went, that's pretty much what you did. Amen? But that is no longer your standard. So he tells us, and be not conformed to the world. That is this idea of being fashioned like, made like the world. But he says to be transformed by the renewing of your mind, which is in Christ Jesus. And by so doing, you'll be able to prove. You'll be able to prove, demonstrate, and show that God's will is good for you, is perfect for you, and it's agreeable. That's what you're going to be able to demonstrate. That if you will be changed and get your mind renewed and be transformed, well, you're going to do that. What are you going to do? You're going to obey God's will. I mean, that's what it is. You're going to find out what God's will is and you're going to do it. That's what it is. You're either going to be conformed to the world or you're going to be conformed to the will of God. That's just the way. There are only only two systems in this world. There's the the devil's system and that's the world. And there's God's system. There's the system of darkness and the system of light. Those are the only two ways of existence that exist in the world. Well, Brother Woods, I thought there were all these religions. Yeah, anything other than Christianity is part of the devil's kingdom. Anything outside of Christianity, I don't care whether it's Buddhism, Islam, Hinduism, I don't care, you name it. If it is contrary, whether it's Mormonism or Jehovah's Witness, if it's contrary to the Word of God, it's in the devil's kingdom and it's part of his world system. Now, his world system, you can do a lot of things. It's a broad path. You can walk a long, wide path in that world. But in Christianity, it's a narrow way. It's a straight gate. It's a narrow path. And it's Jesus Christ and nothing other but Jesus Christ. We've got to have Him and know Him. So you're either in the kingdom of light or the kingdom of darkness. You're either being molded to the world's standard or you're being molded by the Word of God to God's standard. And that is a life conformed to His will. But the one thing about it is, folks, that you get saved. I can't live that way. I can't live this Christian life. It's too hard. It's too difficult. I don't see how you folks live that way. I could never do that. Just let them get saved and they're going to find out something. The first thing they'll find out is, you know what? God's will is actually good for you. It's beneficial. Sin is bad for you. It kills you. Righteousness is good for you. He said that you may prove that what is that good, perfect, and acceptable will of God. And then he talks about this idea of it being uh, acceptable. And that is that it's fully agreeable. It's well-pleasing. It's going to be amazing to you. You thought, I can never dress like that. I can never go to church and do what those folks do all the time. Just get saved. Get your mind transformed. And you'll find when you get there... I didn't think I'd ever enjoy this, but man, this is good, isn't it? <laughs> Woo! I like to be with these folks. I like to hear the Word of God. I like to sing and shout and praise God. I tell you, sometimes we need a renewing because we've lost that sense and somehow the Word or the will of God has, isn't agreeable and pleasing to us. The will of God, if we prove it and we're transformed, we will, we will prove and reveal to this world that God's will is the most pleasing life to live that you can ever live. And then he said, it's perfect. It's perfect. It's complete. The fullest, most satisfying life you'll ever live is in Jesus Christ. Folks think, oh, I can never do that. I, man, I can't live without my whiskey, you know. Well, I can't live without my ball games. Or I can't live without my racetrack. I can't live without this. I've got to have this. You take that preacher and everything's gone. I'm going to tell you right now, you get a hold of Jesus and you wonder how you ever lived with those things. Let alone live without them. Get a hold of Jesus Christ. I'm telling you what I can tell you. I can't live without Jesus Christ. My life is complete. There's a satisfaction. There's a fullness. There's a sense of, of security and a sense of identity that I know who I am. I know where I'm going. And praise God, I have found what life was meant to be in Jesus Christ. It's perfect for you. It's, it, it'll satisfy you. It'll complete you. It'll finish you. But all of this comes as you're transformed. As you transform by what? The renewing of your mind. Now, this is the second thing. 
The first thing you've got to do is know the foundational experiences of salvation. The second thing you've got to do is you've got to renew your mind. The other thing God doesn't do, He doesn't do two things when we get saved. He doesn't empty our mind and He doesn't fill our mind. When you get saved, God will not take out all the dirty pictures you looked at. He will not take out all the bad scenes, all those times you got angry and cussed people out. They'll still be part of your memory. He will all the things you did and sin, the lies you told. Matter of fact, he'll 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 deal with you to go back and fix them. Yeah, if you stole something, he'll deal with you to go take it back. He will not erase your mind. And the other thing he will not do is he will not fill your mind. He doesn't open you up and just pour the Bible in it. Huh? You get saved. He doesn't reach in in your mind and take every bad thing out and put in every good thing. That you will have to do with his help. And by His grace. But your mind has got to get renewed. Now, what does renew mean? It means to make something new. Now, that's real, that's deep theology right there, isn't it? I mean, you, hey, how can you get any deeper than that? I mean, to renew something is to simply make something new. And that's what we need. Our minds have been filled with garbage and junk and all kinds of things when we were in sin. And now when we get saved and God says, I'm going to change you, but I'm going to change you when I make your mind new. In other words, your thinking is going to be transformed. Your life is transformed as your thinking is transformed. And as your mind becomes renewed, you get a new concept, you get a new principle, you get a new purpose, you get a new idea, you get a new uh, 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 work and a new principle from God's Word. And that comes into your mind. And you conform your life to it. And your life becomes new because your mind has become new. So you renew your mind. Now, how do you do that? What is to renew the mind? Uh, let's just talk about three simple things. All right. Uh, simple verse. First, First Peter 2. We know it, but we'll read it. First Peter 2 and verse 2. Let me have one of these young men, as quickly as they may find it, to read that, please, for us. Read the first verse with it as well. First Peter 2, verse 1 and verse 2. You with me? Say amen now. All right. All right. You, you got to get rid of what kills your desire so you can have the desire. The Bible is a book of truth, so get rid of the hypocrisy and the guile. The Bible is a book of, of, that talks about the nature of God, goodness. So get rid of the malice. Get rid of the self-centeredness, because this book is centered on Jesus Christ. The envies that come because you compare yourselves among yourselves. Get rid of all that junk. That'll kill your appetite for the Word of God. Get rid of it. You wonder if you've got any of that mess in your life, you wonder why you don't want the Word of God. I'll tell you why. Because if you've got that junk in your life, you won't want to go to the Word of God because it'll nail your hide to the wall every time you do. It'll reveal you. And you don't want that. So get rid of that. And then as newborn babes. Now, he didn't tell them they were newborn babes, but he said as a newborn babe. Desire the sincere, the unadulterated, the the um, the word that is is not or that is that is pure, and, and desire that sincere, unadulterated, pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby. When the first thing you've got to do in order to win the battle in your mind is to, re, or the second thing is to renew your mind, and the first thing you've got to do to renew your mind is you've got to fill your mind with the word of God. I know that's simple. I know it's been stated so many times. You're probably tired of hearing it. But it's just that way. How do you get rid of bad thoughts? Yeah. You've got to think other thoughts. But you can't think other thoughts if you don't have those thoughts in there to think. Now, what are the best thoughts in the world to think? Yeah. The thought, what is the Bible? It's the thoughts of God. If you really want to say it that way. He says, my ways are higher than your ways. My thoughts are higher than your thoughts. That is his thoughts. That's what he thinks. You want to know what God thinks? That's what the Bible's about. It's his thoughts. You cannot erase your mind as a Christian. You cannot erase bad thoughts. But you can fill your mind with other thoughts and in time you will push those thoughts so far away that it will be as if they're erased. And it'll be, the devil will have a hard time recalling them because your mind is so filled with other things. The reason that oftentimes 
that we have a hard time defeating envy, jealousy, bad thoughts against a brother or other things, is because that's what we have allowed to feel our mind. It's just simple that way. That's what you let go on in your mind. You've got to fill your mind with the Word of God. Now, you've got to do that. How do you fill your mind with the Word of God? Do what? That's the first thing you've got to do, is you've got to read it. Alright? You've got to memorize it. Even reading it will not be enough. You have to memorize it. Now, you may not be a, a great memorizer of Scripture, but if you can read it frequently enough, then even the reading of it will put it in there. Listen to it preached. Amen? Hear the Word of God preached. So, read it. You memorize it. You meditate on it. I know those are simple. I understand we know them. But it's, it's not magic. If you're going to win the battle in your mind, you've got to get some artillery up there. You've got to get some armory up there. You've got to have something that you can defeat the enemy with. And you can't defeat him under your own thinking and your own logic and your own reason and your own power and your own opinions. Get God's thoughts in your mind. Fill your mind with the character, the nature, and the ideas and the principles of God's Word. And let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly. And I'm here to tell you, you will have a battery of arms. You will have a set of artillery artillery that will enable you to defeat the enemy at every turn. I can't tell you how many times when I'm out there and I'm working, I have to and, and the my battle comes to my mind. I have to call to mind the Scripture. And sometimes if I, I can't quote it, I run, I get my Bible, I know where the verse, I look it up, I read it again, and I say it over and over again because that is the principle by which I choose to live. It's not the repetition of the verse that so much defeats the devil. It's the repetition of the verse. It just helps me Sometimes to silence the shouting and the yelling of the enemy. Sometimes by just taking the verse and repeating it, well, if you can only speak, your mind can only have one voice at a time. <laughs> Woo, glory. So if you're speaking in there, the enemy can't. <laughs> Amen. So, you know, he can't do it. And so I'm speaking and I'm sharing and, I, I, and I'm putting this out uh, and the Word of God and I'm repeating it again and again. Lord, this is what you said. This was your promise. I live by this. When my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. When my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Oh, when my heart is overwhelmed, oh, you say that. It's not the saying of it. It's not so much the repetition of it. It's it's not a, uh, a chant. It's not the sense that it is a... There's a word I'm looking for. Some kind of a... Thank you. It's not some incantation whereby the saying of... Oh, the, where the devil says, Oh no, they uttered the word. I've got to run. Oh no, they quoted the secret scripture. Ah! That's in your sci-fi movies, alright? That's not in the real world. That doesn't happen. The devil doesn't say, Oh, they quoted John 3.16. I'm done for... He laughs. He knows John 3.16 better than you do. No. He, matter of fact, when he came down they, and Jesus was here, they said, we know who you are, the Holy One. The world and the oneness people may not recognize that the Son is eternal and existed for His incarnation, but the devils knew it. We know who you are. <laughs> we know where you come from because we saw you before you ever became a baby. So they knew he was eternal. But anyway, it's not the quotation of the verse. You don't quote it and say it over in your mind just as an incantation. You say it because sometimes you have to do that to silence the voice of the enemy. And when my heart is overwhelmed, I had a particular verse of Scripture that I had to use over and over in my life. In, in Philippians chapter 4, I just used it. Every time this particular thing would come to me, over and over, I would quote that Scripture and, say, and I would say with it, God, this is what you said. Now, I am trusting you. I am committing myself to you. Because what you are doing that when you choose to take that mind to the Word of God, quote the Scripture that deals with the battle you're having. If you're having a battle with some kind of temptation of sensuality, then quote the Scripture that deals with that. If you're having a temptation over pardon or forgiveness of your brother over envy or strife or jealousy, whatever you are having a struggle with, find you the Scriptural principle that deals with your battle. And then quote that Scripture and say it. 
And by so doing, you are letting God know from your heart, Lord, I choose you. I choose your principles. I choose your word. And I can't win this battle. So God, this is what you said. I'm not quoting my word. I'm not saying what I've got to the devil. I'm quoting your word to the devil. And you are able to keep me. And you are able to help me. And I will tell you right now, God will run to your side and meet you because he's got a child that wants to live by his will. And so you win it. And then the enemy comes back five minutes later, ten minutes later. And do it again. He'll try to wear you out, wear him out. And it's determined by the grace of God. But the simple principle is this. You are as strong. He says this over in 1 John. He talked about the young men who were strong because the Word of God abides in them. The Word of God abided in them. You're as strong... As you have this in your heart and life. If very little of this is in you, you have very little strength. Amen? You've got to get the Bible, the Word of God, in your heart, in your mind. And say it over and over and over again. Second Corinthians 10. That's not magic. It's just the way we're made. We have to repeat it because that's the way we're made. And so I will say that verse. I'll say it again. I repeat to myself. When I'm struggling with my own feelings, I'm struggling with my own rights to surrender them. And I've been offended. I've been hurt. Then I go to the Scripture that says, I am crucified with Christ. I am crucified with Christ. Nobody hurt more than Jesus on Calvary. And nobody hurt more than our Master on Calvary. He knows what hurt is. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. And I will say to myself, Dan Woods, you are dead to you. You are dead to you. You are not what's important here. Jesus Christ is important. And I remind, if I gotta remind myself 20 times in one day, I'll remind myself and I'll say, that's the principle I'm standing on. God, you said that I can die to me. And I am dead to me. I am not alive to me. I'm alive unto you. That's your promise. That's my position. I'm your child. That is my right as a child of God. And it is to have the provision whereby I am dead to me and dead to sin and alive unto Jesus Christ. And I'm telling you right now, Lord, I'm counting on that being enacted in my life. I'm reckoning on that which is mine by faith. And if I say it, I have to say it ten times, twenty times in a day because the enemy comes back and tries to bring it back into my mind. Then I bring that scripture you right back. And I'm telling you, there's never, ever, ever been a battle that I've not been able to win by doing it. I have never lost a battle as long as I stay with that book. But if I try to fight it through my own reason, if I try to fight it through my own thinking, I lose it every time. I've got to get the thoughts of God in me. The second thing I've got to do, and this is not a, this is a little bit tougher and I, I want everybody to really think about this and get it in your life. Second Corinthians chapter 10. We know the passage. Verse 4. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. Well, what are they? They're mighty through God to what? Okay, here's our weapons. What are we fighting in our mind? A battle. We need weapons. And the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They are mighty through God. And those weapons are to pull down, are mighty, they are effective in God to pull down strongholds. Now Paul was talking about him as as a minister. I've got these weapons and they're mighty weapons and those weapons can pull down strongholds. I think that's a wonderful thing. And then he says in verse 5, he tells us what the strongholds are. And we know it. I know I've talked here before, but let's, let's look at it quickly again. Casting down what? Imaginations. And every high thing that does what? Exalts itself against the knowledge of God and doing what? Okay. Bringing every captivity, every thought to the obedience of Jesus Christ. Now, a lot of times we think that bringing our our thoughts into the captivity of Jesus Christ in this particular verse of Scripture, we use this verse of Scripture, and we we think that bringing 
our, our thoughts into the captivity of Jesus Christ is whenever my thoughts are going this way and this way and that way and that way and I reign in my thinking that, and so that I, I begin to think properly that that's what the verse is talking about. Well, that's not what the verse is talking about. When you bring in your thoughts, that's bringing them under your control, submitting them to the Lord. Yes, but that's not what he's referring to in this passage. When he talks about bringing every thought into captivity of Jesus Christ, that's not the idea. He talks about it in the context of pulling down strongholds and casting down imaginations. That's the idea. You cast down... A word imaginations means opinions, reasonings, thoughts that you have, uh, mindsets. Everybody's got mindsets. Everybody's got opinions. Everybody's got ideas. Everybody's got a way that they think. You've got these principles that are in your mind. You think a certain way. But many times the way we think is contrary to God's Word. We are not thinking biblically. We are thinking worldly. Humanistically. And so, the only way you're going to cast down strongholds there's only a couple ways that's going to happen in your life. Is number one, you are going to have either one, it's going to come through a fervent study of the Word of God through an open heart for God's Word, where you are somehow able to put aside your biases and go to the Word of God and, and find out what it says. Or, and both together or it's going to come under a ministry that preaches truth to you. Paul said, we are weapons. He talked about us. I'm coming to you and we've got weapons and we can pull the strongholds down in your life. Now, how did Paul pull down strongholds in people's life? It, it requires the person, yes, but it requires something else. It requires a ministry or men who are able to bring the word to your life in such a way to show you that your thinking is wrong. And that the way you're thinking is unbiblical. And so, biblical principles are either learned by you reading, studying, or they're learned through, through proper preaching and teaching of the Word of God. So that when the truth comes to you, and you see, and you hear the truth preached, and you realize all of a sudden, uh, that's not the way I understood it. That's not the way I've been thinking. That's not the way I've been living. Now you've got, you got to do something. If that truth is witnessed to your heart and it's been preached according to the Word of God and it's righteous, what you've got to do in your life, because you've got a stronghold, you've got a way that you've been living, you've got a way that you've been thinking, you've got a way you've been reasoning, and now you've just found out that your reasoning is wrong according to God's Word. So what you've got to do is you've got to do a violent act. You've got to reach into your own heart and your mind and you've got to tear down your idolatrous way of thinking. You've got to tear down your high thoughts that have been exalting themselves against God's knowledge and allow the knowledge of God to take root in your life. And so what you've got to do is everywhere that you are shown that your thinking is inconsistent with Scripture, don't make a defense for it. Don't build the fort higher. Don't try to justify yourself. Don't try to call the neighbor and see who else will believe along with you. No, reach in there and start tearing down the stronghold. Reach it down. Tear down every defensive weapon with it. Rip it all out. Cut the idol down. Burn that thing. Bury that thing. And cast it away from you. And say, I will live by the Word of God and God's Word alone. Now that takes a violent act on our part because we don't like to change our thinking. One of the hardest things there is for us to do is to change how we think. When we are accustomed to thinking a certain way and then all of a sudden through the Scripture we are found that that way is wrong. Oh my. Look out. The battle is on. Who does he think he is? Hmm. Well, I've heard it this way for 50 years and I'm not changing now. Well, if it's just his opinion, that might be alright for you to do that. But if it's been substantiated through the Scripture and the Holy Spirit of God and you felt the witness in your own heart, 
quit making a defense. Quit trying to justify yourself. Quit trying to find some place to somehow. Look, I know it's hard. You feel embarrassed. Am, am I right? I know. I've had to change my thinking. You, you kind of want to scratch your head and say, wow. Isn't it, isn't it difficult to admit you don't know everything? Isn't that tough? It's just hard to come to that place. Well, we'd never say it, but <laughs> any refusal to change our thinking is basically saying, but I know better. <laughs> no, it, it, it's just difficult for us because we get embarrassed and we get, we get where we just kind of feel like, oh, no, people are going to think I'm not as smart as they really think I am, you know, and they're going to really see that. How can I have been so foolish and not seen that? Forget all that junk. That's all the mess the devil's trying to do. That's the battle. That's part of the battle that goes on. You get there and that battle's going on in your mind. Well, 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 what about this and what about that? I have no problem with you getting your questions answered. But that's what I'm talking about. This book, the weapon of this truth in the hands of anointed, wise preaching and teaching is a tremendous weapon to tear down every argument, to tear down every self-justification, every false idea that you've got in your thinking can be adequately destroyed by the proper teaching and preaching of this holy book under the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Amen? That's why you don't want to sit under some dead loose teaching that tells you what you want to hear. You want something that comes with the truth of God's Word. And again, I don't have a problem with getting your questions answered. If there's a lingering question, well, what about this? I understand that argument. Sounds good so far, but there's a question that's left unanswered. If there's a question that's left unanswered, then get it answered. And I'm telling you, there is an answer. And, and that's a problem we've had with a lot of folks in the church. Uh, that a lot of times uh, these preachers say, well, well, you need to live this way because I say so. Or, well, we've always done this in the church. Anybody that thinks after a while they're going to realize that that just doesn't work for me. That, that's, not, that's not a good argument. That's no good. That's a carnal weapon. If your weapon is just, well, this is tradition. This is what we've always done. That's a carnal weapon. This is a spiritual weapon. Why is it mighty? Why is the Word of God mighty? Because it's in the hands of the Holy Ghost. When it's under the anointing and the power of the Holy Ghost, it can illuminate truth to your mind and it can reveal the idolatrous thoughts that you have that have exalted themselves against the thinking of Jesus Christ. Now, I'm going to tell you, when you get saved, you don't know it all. And I'm going to tell you, after you've been saved 40 years, you still won't know it all. But this is a violent act that we don't like to do. And many times we can't win the battle in our mind because there's some self-justification we won't tear out. We won't let the Word speak, take it for what it is, and accept it. And just say, okay, that's the way I'm going to live my life. And you tear down your false thoughts. You tear down your idolatrous thoughts that have exalted themselves like idols against God. They've been an image on a high hill. They've been some grove that you've erected on a high hill and you've formulated those thoughts. That's why so many times you need the preaching of the Word. I, glory to God. You know, folks come today and they get saved. I think that's one of the reasons we're having such a hard time. We're going to have to, folks... Depend on the Holy Spirit and this Word more than ever. But we're, we're having a hard time sometimes reaching out there to people because we look at them and we think their lives are so foreign. How in the world is this tattooed, body-pierced, orange-spiked hair, humanistic, worldly person that has had nothing but a mind filled with Hollywood the garbage in the internet and you think how in the world is God ever going to take that person and make a holy good person out of them? Well, and what we want is we want them to come in and after two weeks we expect them to do, live, talk and be exactly like those of us who have been raised in it and been in it for 40 years. That isn't going to happen. That is not going to happen. Get used to it. 
and write it down. No, it will take the consistent preaching to tear down the strongholds in their mind and their humanistic thoughts. And they've got ideas about their family that are wrong. They've got ideas about marriage that are wrong. They've got ideas about how they raise their children that are wrong. They've got ideas about how they work that are wrong. They've got ideas about how they buy that are wrong. They've got ideas about how they dress that are wrong. Now, some of those things, God's going to instantly deal with them. They're going to see it in us and they're going to be changed. They're going to have a hunger to do what's right. They're going to be transformed and God's going to save them. I'm not talking about folks easing their way out of sin. They get out of the sin business the day they repent and believe in Jesus Christ. And what they know is sin. But there's a lot of things they don't know, Brother Ross. And they've been, they've been on that college campus. They've sat four years under liberal teachers and liberal professors. And I'm here to tell you, but this is what I want you to know. i got a mighty storehouse right here. i got some weaponry and an arsenal in Genesis through Revelation that can rip out and tear down every false thought and every wrong way of thinking that's in them, it is possible because our weapons are not carnal but are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. But you've got to have a mind that says, okay, I've got an area in my mind that's been captivated by the enemy. I've got a way that I think that is worldly. And it's the way the world thinks. And I've seen it through the Word. Now what i got to do is I gotta capture that place. And I gotta tear down that idol. And now I bring it into the captivity of Jesus Christ. It's brought within the fortress and the confines of the Word of God. When you think outside the Word of God, you gotta tear that down and bring that thought so that now it is subject to God's Word and I'm gonna think like God wants me to think. And I'm telling you, there's people that have sat in the church for 50 years. And they've got some strongholds. There's some strongholds in holiness that it seems it would take consistent, deliberate, direct preaching, hammering, hammering, hammering again and again to pull down those strongholds. It can be done. But if you don't have a people that are willing to tear down strongholds and understand that principle, and you've got a people who think we've already got it all together, then I'm telling you right now, you're never going to make it. i got to close here. Tear down the strongholds. And the fine thing is, is you've got to develop a Christian mindset. That's what will help you. Fill your mind with the Word of God as you, as you see where you, your thinking is wrong and you've got that. Don't make a defense for it. Tear it down. Rip it down the stronghold. And then, by so doing, learn to think biblically. Develop a Christian mindset. Think like a Christian. You know how easy it is to think sometimes like the world because you're around it all the time? You've got to learn to think like a Christian. I, I don't know. I, I, have a, I think differently than a lot of folks, I suppose. But I was listening to a preacher not long ago and he was saying some things, different ideas about the church. And what I understood, of course, in, in the Scripture, my study of government, and my knowledge of Jesus Christ, I'm like, man, I can't believe you got folks in the church that think like that. I just don't think. I don't understand that kind of mindset. I don't think like that. But it's amazing how sometimes we think just like the world. We have the same suspicions. Amen? We have the same arguments. And none of our arguments are by Scripture. They're just our opinions. They're just our suspicions. And, and we, we're just like that world out there. And I, I, I get amazed at that. So... You've got to learn to think biblically and develop a Christian mindset. Uh, I don't know. I, I've got time to go through them, but I, I, I want to mention them for just a second. Go, uh, Philippians, please. They're just part of it. There's, there's several things you can talk about, but Paul talked about that mindset. And, um, you can find it, and he uses this word think or mind, and, and it's uh, uh, one particular word found throughout Philippians. He talks a lot about the way they think. And in chapter 1 and verse 7, he talks about how he thinks about the people and um, how that God's begun a good work in them and He will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. And um, he said, it's meet for me to think this of you all. You know, that was a, that's a mindset that I'll, I'll be honest with you. It, it's been a real recent, I don't know, last two years or more in my life. Not in the last few months, but it's been coming to me stronger and stronger. And that is this. You are God's work. I remember the first church I pastored in, in, in West Virginia. Man, it was so frustrating. I, I wanted to change everybody. 
I, I just wanted to live their life for them. I, I did that a long time here. You know, you just see so much and you want to, you want to live everybody's life for them. And you, you come to a realization, number one, I can't do that. I can't live your life for you. You're going to have to live it. And number two, I can't change people. God's going to have to do that. But God is capable. And, and Paul says, God's begun a work in you and He will finish it. Hallelujah. That gives me a basis to pray. And I, I have to train myself, Sister, Sister uh, Gracie, to, to look at that and look at some person that I thought, well, God's got a lot of work to do in that person. <laughs> Lord, you better hurry up because you've been slacking on the job. And, 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 and no, 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 no. Lord, you have started this work. You have, I have seen evidence. You have done this in this person's life. And you can finish this work. And I want you to know I'm on your side. I want you to know, God, I'm with you in this. If there's anything I can do, I want, I'm, I want to pray. I want to lift this person up to you. And I'm asking you, God, please do your work in that person's life. I want you to change your heart. I want you to illuminate them. There's no way I can convince them. There's no way that I can bring light, Lord, to them. But you can do it. Holy Spirit, you know how... To talk to anybody. And I had to get that mindset in me. If not, then it's just me trying to do the work through my preaching and my efforts. And I have to realize, hey, wait a second here. This isn't about just me. When I get up and preach, I've got to believe that God can put this in your hearts and make it real to you as well. In, in Philippians chapter uh, 2, he mentions about Verse 5, let the mind be in you which is also in Christ Jesus. And it's this idea of service and sacrifice. We had some of that this past weekend. But that's a Christian mindset. And I, I, I've known this mindset for a long time. I, I grew up in a family where I learned to serve. And uh, my daddy saw to that. Uh, you learn to serve. And so, uh, you know, I, I just working and did things and I worked half my life on volunteer labor. Uh, you know, I could, I just, you just didn't get paid most of the time work I did growing up. Didn't get paid a lot anyway, but you know, you work. We went out and helped people. I cut wood. I did just work all the time as, as a young boy and, and labor, but you learn to serve. And then I remember the emphasis we placed on that because when we first started in WPC 20 years ago, I, I'll be honest with you, we had some folks who weren't used to working. And they came out of big churches where everything was kind of there, you know, and everybody kind of did it. And folks weren't used to digging in and laboring on their own, you know. And we had, you know, meetings and fellowship meetings and general assemblies. And, and we had one church that, that we were going to for a general assembly. And this and the people of this church had a meeting. And the pastor says, uh, or the leading pastor there said to them, he said, you know what, we need to provide meals. They're coming here. They're, folks are traveling, here, coming here for general assembly. We need to feed these folks. And the people said, send them McDonald's. And we said, no way, Jose. It's our responsibility. They're coming here. We're going to feed them. I can remember those early general assemblies. I was, uh, the general overseers were behind the lunch line and we were putting the food on the plates. And uh, we cleaned up when everybody had left. And, and, and we were doing it over and over and over again. And we were stressing. It was in our preaching. It was in our, our lessons. And the leaders of the church are being examples again and again and again. In this church you serve. In this life we are Christians. You work. You serve. You labor. You give yourself. You sacrifice. You do it again. You do it again. And when you get up, you do it again. And you're not going to let go of it. You're going to serve. You're going to serve. And you are here to be a servant. There's no job beneath you. And, and you just learn that. It doesn't matter if you're cleaning out a commode. There's nothing too little for you to do. And, and I have to remind myself of that, Brother Andrew. Well, you shouldn't have to do that. But why shouldn't I? If Christ can wash people's feet, then I can do the lowest job as well. So you don't get uppity. You, you get, you have that, I'm here to serve. I, I, what can I do? Show me what I can do. More and more, I try to do that. Places I go and and um, I go to see Brother Powers. I went to Africa with him. I said, Brother Powers, what you tell me what you want me to do, and that's what I'm going to do. I'm here to help. I know how many people he has that goes over there with him because I've heard the horror stories that he tells, and the, and he goes over with him to Africa and. Um, and just the, the mess, I mean, that you get. Just the, the complaints and the grumbling and the, 
and the junk and, and stuff that goes on. And so I, I said, Brother, whatever you how can I help you? I'm here to help you. Tell me what I can do. And in, and in any way that I can serve, that's what I want to do. So wherever he asked me to do, that's what I did. Whenever he asked me to preach, I preached. Whenever he preached, I praised the Lord and shouted with him. So whatever it was. And uh, when he went to baptize folks, I did the video camera. You know, that was, the, I didn't mind that at all. But anyway, the point is, is you remind yourself. And I have to remind myself of that. Woods, you're here to serve. Show how you can serve. On and on we could talk about it. In chapter 3, there's the mindset of, of um, it was mentioned by Brother Doug, preached the message on it, so I won't have to say anything there. But in verse 15, he talks about, Let us, us therefore as many as be perfect, be thus minded. And if in anything you be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. Nevertheless, whereto we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule, let us mind the same thing. You, The Christian mindset is this. It's one of always going forward. You live according to what you know and you reach for more. You live according to what you have and you reach for more. When you stop reaching, you quit thinking like a Christian. It was said to us this morning. When you stop trying to grow, when you stop trying to learn, you've quit thinking like a Christian. Because the Christian mindset is, I press, I press, I press, I press. And it doesn't stop when you get 67. I don't know when Social Security is going to be available to me, but whenever it is, it probably won't be here. But uh, at the point, my point is this, you know, you can reach a place now where you can retire. That's good. If you can do that, wonderful. You can retire at least and, 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 and go out and do something else for the Lord. That's great. But the point is, in the Christian life, you never get to the place, you never develop a mindset that says, that's it, I've arrived, I've made it. No, nope. if you get that mindset, you don't have a Christian mindset. Because the Christian mindset is always forward. Brother Doug preached about it this morning. And uh, chapter 4 and verse 2, I beseech Yodius and beseech Sintichi, or Sintiki. That, that, what a name. Sintiki, I think is how it's pronounced. Sintiki. Sintiki. How did you get that? That they, may, that they be the same mind in the Lord. These two folk, women, were in the church. They were fussing with one another. I don't know what they were fussing about, but they were causing a ruckus uh, apparently in the church. And, and Paul, he, c- could you imagine getting this letter read by the Apostle Paul on a Sunday morning in service? And you are syntyche and you odious. And I mean, it's sounding so good. The Apostle Paul is writing and, and, and he's just reading on and all of a sudden, I, I beseech Eodius and I beseech Syntyche that they be the same mind in the Lord. And I could just see those two women looking at one another. Well, the whole church must have known about it. Paul had already heard about it. So anyway, I mean, it wasn't a secret. But anyway, these two women are fussing with one another. And Paul says, get it right. Think alike. You know what a Christian mindset is this? Is that you and I have got to get on the same page in the Lord. And if there is no effort among Christians to get everybody on the same page. Now that doesn't mean that we all have to think alike in every area. But we have to think alike in the areas that deal with our salvation. We all have to think biblically. Amen? Now, you might like blue and I might like black. Or you might like red and I might like green. But those things don't affect our salvation. You may want a yellow house and I want a purple house. Okay, that's all right. You're allowed that liberty. You can do that. You can wear black shoes all the time if you want to. And I can wear brown. But those things and those personal things as well sometimes that we just, we have some of our personal preferences that, that make up our personality. We allow for those differences because they don't affect our salvation. But I'm telling you the things in terms of the principles of God's Word, we have to come together and think biblically and understand we've got to get on the same page in Jesus Christ. And if you don't make an effort to get on the same page, you're not thinking like a Christian. And then in verse 10 of chapter 4, he talks about your mind of me or your care of me has flourished again. You, you were also careful, but you lacked opportunity. The word care is the same word as minded. You were minded of me. You were mindful of me. Uh, but now you've had an opportunity so you can express that mind to me in giving. And that's the thing. Whenever our thoughts of others do not express themselves in actions of good and benevolence towards them, we're not thinking like a Christian. If you as a Christian sit in this church and you think you can live your life independent of everybody else in the church and when someone has a problem, it's not your problem. When someone else in the church has a struggle, oh well, hope they get over it. If you don't make it personal, if you don't feel a part of it, you aren't thinking like a Christian. Because Christians 
feel when other Christians hurt. And when you're in a body, you see a need. And if you don't have a heart to reach out and do something about it and help that person, you aren't thinking like a Christian. You're thinking like the world. So this idea now, we're back to this business of winning the battle in our mind. We need these foundational experiences. We need to renew the mind. We renew the mind by filling it with God's Word, tearing down the strongholds, The thinking, the opinions, the reasonings that are wrong, ripping them out. And then, by so doing, developing a biblical mindset, learning to think biblically. You will be amazed that when you get your thinking straight and you learn to think properly, you'll make better decisions. Hello? You'll give wiser counsel and you won't have as great a battle and turmoil in your mind. Because sometimes the turmoil comes to our mind because the things we've done that was contrary to God's will. And the devil's able to use it against us. Amen? Because we're just not thinking like we ought to. And the final thing I close with here this afternoon is this. You've got to learn to pray. Philippians 4. You've got to learn to pray. If you want to think you can win that battle going on in your mind and you're not willing to pray, forget it. You will not win it. You will lose it. Verse 6, Philippians 4. What's he say? Be careful. Be anxious for nothing. Be anxious for nothing. He said, be angry and sin not. But he said, be anxious for nothing. (laughs) But in everything, what? How many things? But in everything. By what? Prayer. And what? With what? Uh Prayer and supplication. Prayer is the idea of worship. Supplication is the idea of petition. And then thanksgiving. Gratefulness. The brother talked about this morning. That thankful heart. It's very difficult to be upset with someone you're thankful for. Isn't it? Amen. You You develop a thankful heart and you'll be amazed at what will change in your life. How many of you know we live in a most ungrateful generation? I'm telling you, we've got the best life in America that can be handed to us and we're the biggest grumblers on the face of the earth. Isn't it true? We are unthankful. Children don't, are ungrateful towards their parents. People are ungrateful, as a brother mentioned this morning, towards the, we spit in the face of our forefathers. And, and, and just ungrateful for the sacrifices that have been had and, and towards our our. our uh, armies and, 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 and again towards the people in in our churches, our forefathers in our churches that have fought for this Pentecostal holiness way. And and this idea of of bringing that to God and thanksgiving and just thanking God. If you just go to prayer, Lord, I thank you that I can call upon you. I thank you for this wonderful privilege of prayer because it is my lifeline. It is my help. And I'm so glad. I I can't tell you. Sometimes, I'll be honest with you, sometimes recently I haven't got too much praying done because just thanking God. I'm just so thankful for the prayers He's answered. I'm just so thankful that I have the opportunity to pray. Such peace has come to my heart and my mind because I'm able to take something to God in prayer. And here's what you got to do. Don't wait until the anxiety has overwhelmed you. Don't wait until you are just so fraught and distraught with all of the struggle in your mind. And when you go to God, you fall before Him exhausted and you don't even know what to say anymore. The very moment you feel your heart beginning to get gripped, the very moment something that battle's going on in your mind and you feel that anxiety, anxiety coming, hit your knees right then and there. Get on your knees and say, God, here's something I'm having a problem with and I need you to help me. I need you to show me and I need you to direct me. Lord, I'm facing a battle. God, I just, I just, this battle's coming to my mind with, with me and, and, and so and so, Lord. And over my wife, she, you know, or my daughter and, and, and she spit at me last week. And Lord, I, I gotta deal with this thing and help me, Lord, help me, Lord. And, or whatever it is. And you just wanna, over and over, you wanna Play it through your mind. Get on your knees and cry out to God and say, God, I need your help. I'm here to tell you He'll help you. That's how you submit to God and resist the devil. That's how you submit to God and resist the devil. 
You watch, you pray, you see it, you recognize it coming, and right then is when you go to God and say, God, I'm not going down that road. I need your help today. I need your strength. I want you. Folks, faith is a wonderful thing. So how do we win that battle? Get the basic experience, the basic Christian experiences of salvation and live them out. Understand the, the practical nature of those experiences. Renew your mind. Get you some artillery in there. Fill it up with God's Word. Tear down every stronghold. Get your thinking changed. Rip the pride out. Change it. Rip it down. Think biblically. Learn the Christian mindset. Think like Christ thinks. With all the Bible talks about with lowliness of mind. Lowliness of mind. Lord, it's not the idea of browbeating yourself and saying, Oh my, woe is me. I'm a nobody and nobody loves me. That's not lowliness of mind. That's actually worldliness of mind. That's how the world thinks. Or at least many of them do. Some of them either go one or two ways in the world. The world either... Whew, I'm number one. And I don't know why everybody doesn't like me. Or I'm a nobody. And I'm going to commit suicide. And that's the last biggest statement that I can make in the world. And that's what the world does. They go to one extreme. Or the other. That's not lowliness of mind. That's selfishness. That's all it is. It's just supreme thinking of yourself. Lowliness of mind is this. Lord, I'm a slave. I have no rights. I don't own myself. I don't own anything that I have. I have no rights. I'm your piece of property. What do you want me to do? When you start getting to feel like you're better than everybody else, you remind yourself, I'm a slave. I'm a slave of Jesus Christ. And it's wonderful to be a slave of Jesus Christ because He's the best master. He's far better than the devil ever was. I'll tell you that right now. God is a good master. You learn to think biblically. And then you develop a life of prayer. People who can't win the battle in the mind have not learned to pray. Simple point. I'll, I'll ask you a question. When you struggled, and, and when you pray, I'm not talking about going to God and complaining. All right? I'm not talking about going to God and just sitting there and belly aching, moaning, and groaning for an hour. I'm talking about thanking Him, talking to Him, expressing your heart to Him, but being honest and open and saying, Change me, help me, God. But the times that you failed to win the battle in your mind, now ask yourself, were they times in which you was weak or strong in prayer? You'll find out it's a time when you're not praying. You're not reading the Bible. You're not filling your mind with the Word of God. And you're not living out the foundational experiences of salvation. You're not trusting God for the Spirit-filled life. You're not living in the sanctifying power. You're not putting the Word of God in your mind. You're not tearing down strongholds. You're not developing and living according to a biblical mindset. And you're not praying. Don't do that and you will lose the battle in your mind. If you want to win it, that's what you've got to do. Amen? We're going to close. Any questions? Brother yes, sir. Could you, uh, could you share some thoughts on a uh, situation of where a Christian uh, has um, conditions in their body where they're living in chronic pain and as a result of that have become addicted to pain? That's wow. Well, I think if that person is a part of the church, I think that the church has a tremendous responsibility to get a hold of God and see a healing take place. The fact is that God's a healer. And I would say to this, I think I would say to that person, God doesn't want you living on painkillers. I think I can say that biblically. Because he, 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 he bore stripes for our healing. And Paul says in Corinthians, I, all things may be lawful, but I will not be brought under the power of any. I don't think God wants that kind of addiction in us. Uh, I don't see how that God is honored and glorified through that. So I don't, I wouldn't try in such a case, you know, a person to become addicted to it. And, um, I would, I would be, I think it's the church's responsibility to get down and pray with that person, that person as well to say, God, I want your deliverance. 
I don't want to live my life on painkillers. I need your deliverance. And God can again break the addiction in the body to uh, the painkillers and, uh, and He can heal that person. That to me is, is the only path that you can take. I, I can't see where in the Word of the Lord... Again, God doesn't want us to be a slave to those things. He doesn't want us to, uh, to be addicted to those things. Um, and He's a healer. He either he is or he isn't. He is a healer. That's what the Bible says about him. I am Jehovah, your healer. I am Jehovah, your healer. The fact is, is that when Jesus reached out to help people, he was never just concerned. We talk about, well, I'm just concerned about their soul. Jesus wasn't. He was concerned about their soul, but he was concerned about their whole person. He was concerned about their health. He was concerned about their body. He was concerned about their soul. I'm not saying he wasn't. No, that was a primary concern. But I am telling you that Jesus cared for people. He, tell me, show me anywhere in the Bible, in the ministry of Jesus Christ, where someone came to Jesus Christ, believing and asked Him for His help. Show me where He ever turned them away. All that the Father gives me, I say, I will no wise cast them out. And I think that it, that it's a sad commentary on the church if we're not able to pray and see a healing come to that person's life. I, I would be gracious and compassionate towards the person because I know we're we're living in a day, folks. It's tough. It's tough. It's a tough arena, but but we're just going to have to ask God to help us. We are um, we're living in a, in a day in a culture that um, let's just face it, bodies are getting weaker. There's a struggle there, but everything today people look to it for it to be fixed through appeal. And I'm not downing all medicine. I know there's benefits and there's some values to it, and I thank the Lord for it. In in, in regards of where at times it's been helpful. But God's also a healer. And we need to look to Him and ask Him to deliver it. I know He heals. He has personally healed me more than once. He has personally healed me. I know God heals. I stood in this church recently struggling. I had come back. I was worn out. My family had been sick. And I could feel it coming on me. My, my insides... I even told Doug that night, Brother Doug, I don't know if I can make it or not. I said, God, you are a healer. And I, right now, God, I need touch. I cannot get sick. I have got too much. Lord, I need you to heal me. I want to do your work, Lord. And I don't feel this is what glorifies you right now. I'm telling you, that night, God healed me. He healed me that night. And I went home and I was fine. That doesn't, that doesn't mean I'm anything. It doesn't mean that. He is there for all of us. God is a healer, church. We have to get convinced of that. He is a healer. I, that's all I would know to say, brother. I, my counsel to that person would be, sister, brother, whoever you are, let's take this thing to the Lord and let's ask Him for deliverance so that you're not living this way. It's hard. When you pray and you pray and you pray and you do everything you know to do and you still got it. I've had this burden of telling you for five years. Yeah. And I pray I've done everything I know to do. The doctor says I can't help you. There's nothing I can do. And and what am I going to do? I know the Lord you rest it to the Lord. You do what you can and rest it to the Lord. Done everything that I know to do. Sure. And I still got it. Sure. There's no way this is a thing. The Lord is just, He's, he's letting it limit it down so that it don't burn like it did when it started. Mm -hmm. But still, it lets me know it's there. Sure. It comes and it comes. Oh. 
Oh, a lot of. Well, my point was is I wasn't I wasn't trying to fault the people. And I said I would be compassionate towards the person, not trying to condemn them or fault them. But doesn't it become an opportunity for us to pray and get a hold of God, and, and God will give grace? And but you're not addicted to painkillers because of your tongue either. I don't think so. Yeah. My my take on it, sister, is I don't fault people. I pray with people. I don't fault people when they... I mean, I take medicine once in a while. Uh, I don't fault people when they take it. You do what you have to do as far as to take care and minister your body. I don't, I'm not one of those people that nail someone to the wall when you have to take medicine and say you've sinned because I don't find that in the Scripture. But at the same time, I don't think we should just be passive towards it and accept it and say, oh, well, that's where we live and we just got to live with it. No, I think we need to do what was preached somewhat this morning. Our faith needs to grow and we need to ask God to help us because God does heal and God can heal you. And, and, and the church needs to pray and, and ask the Lord and, and see the power of God move again in our midst in a mighty way. And, and many times... Many times we have not because we ask God. And sometimes God wants it to come through the church and not just an individual. And so you pray and, and, and what a testimony can come to the Lord. God can keep you. And I'm, I'm not trying to... I, I, I don't want to repeat myself here. But again, I am not critical of people when they take medicine. I simply am not. I don't, I don't find where I can do that. If people hurt, they hurt. And you can sit there and say, well, their faith is, they got a problem with their faith. Well, then if your faith is so great, lay hands on them and heal them. All right? If you've got the great faith, don't criticize them for their faith if you don't have the faith to heal them. So I don't, I don't, I'm not critical. But at the same time, I'm not passive. I'm not going to let the church off the hook either. We've only got two options. We either say, oh, well, that's the way it's going to be. Tough it out. You know, just let the addiction stand or whatever it is or take the medicine the rest of your life. Or we can say, you know what, sister, brother, we understand you're doing this right now. You're dealing with that the best that you know how to deal with it. We understand. We want you to know we are going to pray with you. We are going to ask God to help you. And we want God to be honored and you to be healed. And you'll know when you're healed and you won't have to take that medicine anymore. And God will be glorified by that. And sometimes, yes, people have exhausted every other means. One woman had went to every physician. She had went ever. Jesus didn't say to her, you shouldn't have been going to them doctors. He didn't say that. He wasn't that kind of critical. We, we get too critical of people. Like I said, if you've got the super great faith, then we'll, we'll form the prayer line and let you go at it. No, that's not it. But let's have the faith. Let's grow the faith. And let's say, and Jesus just said, lady, your faith has made you whole. You came. I know I was your last resort, but you came. That's all right. And you've been healed. God can heal you, Sister Gracie. I just listened. I was up at Brother Powers uh, and last week. And, and folks in that church, just his, his, uh, his aunt, just, uh, they prayed for her. She had Parkinson's. They prayed for her. 
And uh, she went to the doctor. She's been healed. His uncle's been healed of cancer. Uh, I mean, I'm telling you, God heals. And we need God to use people again in those areas of ministry. He talked about the lady. She had cancerous tumors that just fell off of her, rotted and dropped off of her after they prayed. So uh, healing is not for days gone by. It's for us. But I think we need to reconvince ourselves on that again, that God heals. And are we willing? Sometimes, you know, do we want it? Do we want the healing? I, I think if you want to be healed, God will, God will work a way. And He may grow us through it, but, but God, God can do it. God can do it. So, Lewis, I think sometimes we become timid in our ailments of life. And we, we don't like to share it sometimes. Because we're afraid of what people will think about us. And we'll hold it in or, or just carry that burden. But the church needs to be able to feel the burden of our, of our brothers and sisters. And when a brother or sister is sick Absolutely. or has a, a physical or some kind of a dilemma going on in their life, we, we, as, the, we as the body of Christ, the scripture talks about being able to minister one to another. And we've got to be able to help carry that burden. So when one's hurting, we'll hurt with them. Mm-hmm. And we'll cry out to God with them. Likewise, when they're, when they're having when they're full of joy, and we'll rejoice with them too. That's right. And it goes both ways. We like the rejoicing part, but the hurting part sometimes we would hold. And I think I think sometimes we just the church needs to be able to feel like he's talking about them to feel that burden of others and pray. We got to pray as a church. I'm not sure we're asking as much as we need to ask. I, don't uh, think that. I, I just don't think we, you know, and and like you said, brother, sometimes we're afraid to get up and go up and be prayed for. We don't want to do it. But, well, I've been in the prayer line tenth times. But it might be that eleventh time when God moves. The faith reaches and the gift of faith operates and God sees these people want healing. Naaman had to go seven times. It's the seventh time. It's the seventh time. It wasn't the sixth time. It's the seventh time. That's right. That's right. He was still a leper after the sixth time. Go ahead, brother. Yes. Yes. I believe many Christians want to be as conservative as they're a real Christian, as conservative as possible where it comes to pills, medication, that kind of stuff. They're not going to just indulge in a medication because they want the medicine. If they're a real Christian, they're not going to do that unless they have a reason to take a medication. I mean, I've taken ibuprofen since I was probably. I mean, I would go through a bottle of ibuprofen in what six months, maybe. Um, I, I don't. Take, there's some weeks I don't even have to have it. Other weeks I may have to take four pills at a time for two days. So it just it, you you know where you stand between you and God in those situations too. And if you cannot get the healing for whatever reason, I mean, we have a lot of ailments. Why would we have to have hysterectomies? Why would we have to have heart surgeries? Why would we have to have these things if it's all available? If it's always right there at our fingertips? We have to deal with these things and it's just part of, part of living. Some of it is. And um, at the same time, some of it has just been accepted. We've not really went to God to get an answer. We've not really sought God. Some have. But a lot of times... To be honest with you, if we're honest with ourselves, it's a much easier. It's much easier just to take the medicine than it is to believe. I don't know why it shouldn't be, but it is. I was thinking, brother, Lou, with our economy going like it is, and healthcare system seems to be firing into a, a negative aspect. That when I'm talking to my daughter and my wife about years gone by, they didn't have the easy access that we have today to some of the things we have. They cried out to God that that, that was their option. In a lot of cases, people, that was their only option they had. That's so right. Answered and, and, inter- and was able to intercede and help them. We may be heading back towards that in a lot of our crops and things that we promised customers to have.
having readily access need to be thought to take away from them. And, and it might be for our, our betterment in some ways. I mean, to get us back to a stronger relationship with our God. It's easy to have faith when you don't have it. It's a lot harder when you do. It's, easy, it's hard to have the faith to, to pray God take away the headache when you know the title on the cross. If you don't have that title, That's it. it changes it. Change the situation. What I was going to say, brother, was I, I was kind of hitting out because I agree so much with what you just said. The fact we just need to get faith says, okay, we're going to pray for this. That God's going to do it. Just believe that. Trust in it. But I did think about things, and we've got people in our congregation that, I mean, I don't know if she's doing an ostrich friend that took medicine because of the cancer. Brother Steve Mitchell has to take medication every day because of his heart. If he doesn't take it, he'll die. End of story. He has got to take medicine that keeps his immune system down, and he may not die. If he does not take that medicine, he's out of here. I mean, Brother Knox, Brother Mac, Brother Mac Parkinson, there's the medicines to take care of that, and and I see all those things, so old brother Steve Bonner back here, he is always a good one for a loaded question. I'll tell you. That. And, uh, it's, but that's a good it's, question. It's, it's an honorable question. I don't mean it. When I, let me explain that, 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 what I, that statement about being a loaded question because I've dealt with Sister Gracie's and brother Steve Mitchell's and, and brother Knox's and brother, uh, brother Mack and others. But I've also dealt with people that are, that are addicted to pain medication. I've dealt with people that started out with cancer. I got a cousin in West Virginia that started out on painkillers. They went through all the process. They went back, said, "Listen, you don't have cancer. There's nothing here." But the man stayed in chronic pain. He is still in chronic pain and constantly. And, and I'll tell you things. You got to weigh out what kind of medication they on. Are they taking ibuprofen? Or are they taking codeine? Are they taking hydrocodone? They taking oxycontins? What kind of medication? Every situation, you've got to weigh it out. Where is it at? What are they in? What kind of problems do they have? I mean, and I, I said all this because I sure don't want to take, I, I kind of sh- didn't want to say anything because I want to take away from what you just said because I agree. But, and I've watched this man. His problem, he, he, your body, you take painkillers because of pain, and that pain may go away and you'll still feel pain. Because now you've got a body that's enslaved to, to, an addicted, to an addicted state and your body will crave that, that drug so much you need. You'll hurt. You'll shake. Your body wave. You'll quake all over. I mean, you, I've watched healthy men, healthier than probably anybody in this room, shake and fall down and kick and scream and go in convulsions because they didn't have a high and they wasn't on. I'm talking prescription drugs. And there's a huge difference between, between taking a, 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 a pill or something for for a pain or a little thing than being addicted to a painkiller. And I mean, and they do. These men, they, you get addicted to that. And I mean, I got a cut, like I said, I got a cousin right now. But he is in the hospital getting dried out because his cancer's gone. There's absolutely physically nothing wrong with the man. And that is even a little different than what Brother Steve said because he said a man that does have chronic pain. And that's a different situation. How do you deal with that? And, and, and the Bible teaches is we, that we've got to learn moderation. If you do, that, if there is something there, and it's, it's there's so much got to be weighed out. But I, I said all that to come back to, to the point you said, Brother Woods. We need to have faith that if it's chronic pain, if there's genuine pain, if there's no pain, if there's physical ailment, God can heal Brother Steve Mitchell, and he'd never have to take that medicine again. God can do that. God can heal Parkinson's. God can heal cancer. God can heal. We've got to. I want to get to the place that we can see it happen now. I don't, I, I, and Brother Al's right. It would be to our benefit that if all the hospitals dried up and you didn't have it, the medicine stores dried up, because you have to trust God. I don't want that to be our case. If it comes, let it be because we've got faith before that happens. It's not because he's forced into having faith, but because we love God and can see it happen. And I think we just need to believe that God can deliver and and, and, and work through it and God will give a man the wisdom to know what to do in every situation. Um, I, I understand Sister Gracie and her situation and um, the pain that she goes through. My mother had that. So I, I, when the first time I heard her telling us that she had that, I really my heart really went to her because my mom had it and my mom used to beg me to uh, let her chew gum when she's going to sleep at night. And the nurse said, you can't do that. She had to sleep on the back. She's going to swallow it. She's going to choke on it. She's going to die. And 
I had to tell my mom, you can't do that. And she, I talked to my mom, his tongue is burning, it's on fire. And that was the hardest thing to tell my mom. You, I had to take her gum away from her. I mean, it was that simple. And what my question is, is I felt that because I, I connected with Sister Gracie in her situation. So I prayed for her. I prayed for her. Because I felt that it was it connected with me. What she was going through. I knew what she was going through. Probably more and more people did here. I just like to ask the question, how much are we praying for each other? That's the point. We're praying for these people that are hurting and stuff. Mm -hmm. More than just when we gather together on Sunday mornings or Sunday mm -hmm. nights and stuff. Mm -hmm. We got to get, we got, what do you say if we caught, we got to put into action, get on God mm -hmm. and pray. Yes. Even situations that are mentioned, you know, I don't know, I, you've taken a painkiller once in a while or whatever, and off and on, but many times we just accept it as a status quo. Well, this is the way it is. I deal with it. Again, God doesn't just automatically heal. It comes in answer to prayer. It comes in answer to seeking the Lord and believing His power. And I agree, Brother Doug. How much? Uh, how much? How much do we really want it? It's 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 like if you've got a crutch, you're making it with the crutch, if, and you become content to live with the crutch, you'll live your life that way. But you have to somewhere get a desire that says, I don't want the crutch anymore. I want free. And you also, I think, have to have a right motive to get free. I've not, I've not, the other night, I just shared my experience. It hadn't always happened that way. I've just seen God do it many times that way in my life. I've had several times that God's done it. And when I was getting sick, I just, Lord, I just don't feel this is where you want me at right now. I don't, I don't. You know, sometimes God allows the sickness to come because you need to take a break. But I, I, Lord, that is not what I feel. I do not feel this and I want to see I need your hand of deliverance in me. But I'm not asking you to heal me because I don't want to go throw my guts up somewhere. I'm, I'm asking you to heal me, God, because I have got a lot that's happening in my life this week. And it's essential that I do this. It's essential in your kingdom. And I ask you this so I can work and labor in your kingdom. God healed me. Now, again, there's other times I've had struggles, but sometimes our faith has got to also reach out in, why do I want healing? Do I really want God to be honored and glorified? And if we get a church seeking God's glory, and God will do these things. I, I, like I said, you either, we either just accept it as a status quo or we say, wait a minute, do we have a basis in this Word to ask God for miracles? If we do, then it's our responsibility to ask Him for it. It's hard when you never see Him, though. It's really hard because it's just like for me, I can honestly say that I hate to have to take my ibuprofen because I know it's going to irritate my stomach. If I have to take that ibuprofen for the rest of my life, I'm going to be in more pain and more problems. And you hate having to take a medicine. But it's either that or lay around and do nothing. So, so I mean, you, you're, you feel like a lazy Do you believe that God wants to heal you of that? Well, I, I don't see why He wouldn't. He, every good and perfect gift. I mean, He gives good gifts to those He has. He doesn't withhold any good things He doesn't ask. I've, I've quoted the Scripture so many times. I don't see where He wants to hinder me. Other than that there was some reason that I don't foresee that God sees. But, but why don't we see healing? We need Him. We need Him, but we don't see Him. 
Well, first of all, it's a great thing we're asking for. And when you ask for something that's great, there should be the thing when the thing asked for is large, the desire expressed in the asking ought to somewhere be equal with the thing that's asked for. So that when you're asking for such great things, I don't think it should be that the power of God should fall on the church because we had a five minute prayer meeting. Or because we've just asked God to heal our back once every blue moon. Or only when we're feeling a little bit of pain. Or we went to, Lord, I really need you to touch today. Really help me, you know. But how much has it really been a focus? How much have we really made it a focus? A week of prayer? A week of fasting? Or, or a time of just cleansing? Before, Lord, I really I want you to be honored by this. And I really need deliverance. I mean, if we ask ourselves, because the pill bottle is there, as Brother Emery said, it's just much quicker and easier to grab that and be done with it than it is to really consecrate yourself. And when you're asking for something... And again, we're talking about a problem that's church-wide. It's not just here. It's everywhere. It's everywhere. Miracles aren't... They're happening in spots. But there's nowhere that it's happening in, in a great measure anywhere in America that I've read of or know of. But you have not because you ask not. You receive not because you ask amiss. It goes back to those things. And I, I think that somewhere... If we get a basis in the Word of God, God can do it, church. We just have to pray. And we, we have to consecrate ourselves and say, Lord, help us. But I know this. That's where I think I try to be careful and not condemn people. I want to encourage you. I want you to know God heals. I've experienced that. I've seen it. God heals. I haven't seen Him heal everybody I lay hands on. I, there's sometimes I feel faith. There's sometimes I feel like a cloud of doubts over it. But I tell you, He's not going to come to an atmosphere of criticism. If you're browbeating and criticizing folks, and it's your fault we don't have the power, and it's your fault, or, or if we've just become got a lot of crutches we're leaning on, God's not going to come. Sometimes, sometimes, what Brother Al talked about becomes necessary. Sometimes God has to put us in a box where we have nowhere else to go so that we learn to turn to Him and He can display His power to us. Sometimes that's the only thing He can do. I'm like Emory too. I'd rather it not come to that. But if it must come to that, then let it so be. Because God needs to be sanctified again in our midst and glorified. years, actually 36 years ago this March, my mother was praying for me in West Virginia. It was wintertime, early spring. And it was cold. She got up and we stayed and went out one night. And she got up and she actually had a silk night down on my dad and went to work. And she went to the stove and she grabbed the bottle and, and I can't remember she thought it was kerosene and it ended up being gasoline. I can't remember now. It was extremely flammable. She put the fire, the, the, the liquid into the stove and when it hit, it blew back up on her. It burnt her, I think it was 70 or 80 percent all over her body. Her silk nightgown immediately caught flame, embedded into all of her skin. She was in an awful state, awful state. And they rushed her to the emergency room. She was like, it was early, it was like February. She was eight or nine months pregnant, that was one of the end, toward the end of March. And they took her to the doctor, they put her in the hospital, admitted her, said, You're going to be in here, you're going to come out, you're going to have to be in, in intensive care for months, you're going to take. Months of recovery, you're going to have, to have surgeries, you're going, to, you're going to be extensively scarred. And the church went to prayer. Your daddy went to prayer. And every night for seven days they prayed. They met to the church. This, this, nothing else, specifically prayer for my mother. And God and the healer. And after seven days, my mom walked out. And she's got one little scar, about the size of a penny, on her leg. Of that, of that time she had no scar. They told her to take months for her recovery. Seven days she walked out of the hospital. But for seven days. How many are willing to make sacrifice? How many are willing to take the time? How many are willing to shut down and say, okay, so next, every night this week we're going to meet and pray for so and so? We, we think that's strange when that happens. It just becomes a weird thing to us and we mess up with our routines. It's much easier to go to the pill bottle. But I'm telling you, folks. 
Thank you, Brother Henry. I remember. God heals, church. Let's not be critical of one another. Let's not take the attitude, oh no, I'm taking medicine, I'm bad, I'm, a, I'm just an unbeliever. No, you're not. You're saved and you love God. And being sick is not a sin. And having a body that hurts is not a sin. And God doesn't send people to hell because their faith struggle over a healing. Saving faith is, was, is the most important thing. And if you believed in God has saved your soul, then look, that's good. But faith can do much more. God can do much more. So we're not going to criticize one another. We're not going to beat up someone who does take medicine. And we're not going to get a woe is me attitude because we've taken a pill. But we are going to go to God and say, God, lift us up. Get us where we need to be. And begin to make a daily habit of doing what Brother Doug said. Get someone on your heart in this church and keep them before God's throne until God does a miracle. I've seen that in numerous areas. I've, I've seen it at times of healing. But I've seen it in many other areas that I've prayed for. God's given me answers time and time again. Why can't He do it in this area? He can and He will. But let's just get on board with it. Amen? Let's ask God to help us. Let's make it a point of prayer. Let's make it a point of prayer. Can I say too, brother? I mean, I'm not, I don't preach against not taking medicine. And uh, I just want to encourage the church to help us to realize that God cares about us. Amen. And He's not going to put more on us than we can withstand. That's right. He's on, he, we're His children. And That's right. Our pains. That's right. Our That's right. And God cares about us. Absolutely. And we've got to convince him. Absolutely. I agree. I don't believe it's something that faded out in generations past. I believe it's for us today. Amen. I Some... believe God cares about every ache and pain we have. I agree. But yeah. Lord, just to say, I believe in healing because when I was first told the Holy Ghost was called two weeks after I told the Holy Ghost, my grandfather started having a stroke and my, he, my grandmother called up to my dad and told him um, uh, that granddad was question is what we're going to do about it. Let's let this talk this afternoon be fruitful for us. Amen. Let's let it encourage us. How many will take this to heart and start asking God, Lord, let me put someone in my heart. Let me pray. Let me pray more. Let me get this in my heart, Lord. Put this in my heart so I can see God do miracles. How many want to see that? Amen. And other things that God needs to deal with us, let that happen as well. There may be other areas of our life. The Lord needs to deal with us on. And uh, let the church be so together in harmony and oneness and love. The other things that we've been preaching and teaching about. Winning these other battles. And then God can do more through us. Amen. Amen. Let's get more spiritual. Get rid of some of the carnality. Because we don't want the power of God coming on a bunch of carnality. Amen. We want the power of God coming to folks who are spiritual mature and know what to do with it. So it's, it's a great 
privilege. It's a great blessing. It's also a great responsibility. It's a great responsibility. When the Lord moves in power, it will radically change your life. I think we can... I don't know. what I could go on all afternoon. Let's stand. Okay. Also, Brother John, I've been sick since Wednesday. Miss Church Wednesday night. What's wrong, Brother John? He's got the virus. Okay, let's remember Brother John. Church, he's sick, man. It's for my sister.